Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Dan Pickett, co-founder at Launch Academy, here to bring you another episode of the HTML show. Today, we're going to be talking about CSS positioning and using CSS as a means to manipulate how elements are positioned on our web pages. So we're going to use things like floats and clears today. We're also going to use absolute and relative positioning. And then we're going to close out the discussion and round out the discussion around uh, CSS layering and uh, working with uh, sort of the, uh, the, the three-dimensional perspective, if you will, of our HTML web page. So we're going to be talking quite a bit about that. But before we jump into the elements of CSS positioning, I first just want to talk about uh, some of the homework that I had assigned in the previous assignment where I asked you to essentially integrate the HTML5 boilerplate with uh, the web page that you've written to date. So what I've done here is I've brought in all of the HTML5 boilerplate code uh, into my original web page. And notice that uh, I've incorporated things like the Apple touch icon, uh, the viewport attribute, as well as uh, modernizer and things like that. But I've also modified this HTML5 boilerplate a bit to use absolute positioning, or I'm sorry, not absolute positioning, but absolute paths, uh, so that you can see here that my CSS references to external assets here are preceded by a slash. And if you remember from the HTML5 boilerplate, it's using a relative path. And because we're using MAMP and we're practicing like professional developers uh, in building an environment that resembles our production environment, I've gone ahead and changed those to absolute paths so that we have them. Another thing that you're going to want to do when you integrate uh, HTML5 boilerplate in with existing projects is you really don't want to incorporate the doc folder. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete that folder right now for us. And if you've done those things, then you're in really good shape. And really, mainly, the things that you want to ensure you have are uh, the references to Modernizer uh, and some of the uh, XUA compatible uh, elements and the viewport element so that you're looking good in Internet Explorer and uh, mobile devices, respectively. So uh, go ahead and make those changes as part of today's work, uh, if you haven't already. And let's dive into the wonderful but very confusing and complex world of CSS positioning. So if you remember on my web page, I kind of had this neat little call to action here. And we use this call to action as a mechanism to kind of highlight one thing that I want, to do, want you to do as a user of my web page. And uh, this is a pretty frequent uh, paradigm and pattern nowadays. And we're going to use CSS positioning to make this call to action a little bit more clear uh, and make it a little bit more predominant in the context of the page layout. So when we talk about CSS positioning, we're really talking about how we're positioning or coordinating elements in relation to one another and to the overall coordinates of the page. And if you think of the page almost like an X and Y plot, uh, it will talk about how you can kind of move things around without necessarily having to uh, rely on the normal flow of the HTML elements themselves. So to start with, let's take a look at the float concept. So what I can do is I can actually set this element to float. And what it's going to do is it's going to take it out of the normal flow of the HTML that I've produced here. So when I go ahead and I go into my style.css document, which is all of the CSS that was in the original HTML, I'm going to go ahead and change my aside. I'm going to remove that margin. And I'm going to use floats and clears to kind of take it out of the layout and give it its own sort of sense of predominance on the page. So when I change it to float right, watch what happens. Let's compare and contrast the two. So if we open this up in Chrome Inspector, and I disable, let's make this a little more clear here. If I disable that float attribute, notice how it affects the positioning of my image that's underneath the actual aside element. And the reason for that is that the float 
CSS property, if I set it to left or right, it's actually gonna take it out of the context of the HTML web page. So let's go ahead and actually take a look at what that means. We can go ahead and put these elements in a container. And I'm gonna just do some basic diagnostic stuff so that it's easy for you to visualize what's happening here with the float perspective. So I'm gonna set uh, this container, and we'll call it float container for demonstration purposes. And in my CSS, I'm going to set this background color to yellow, and it's gonna be very ugly, but I wanna drive this point home of what floats actually do. So if I actually set my float container's width to 75%, for example, and I'm gonna remove this float, see how the yellow envelops both my side element and my image tag? And because we're setting the width to 75%, the uh, yellow is gonna extend to 75% of my screen. And as I expand or contract my browser window, that yellow background is going to persist for 75% of the horizontal real estate. Watch what happens when I change my aside to float right. That aside, and we uh, remove the width. Notice that it's completely shifted itself from being in a uh, horizontal relationship to the HTML image, and it's pushed to the right. So we've constrained this float to essentially be boxed in by the con float container, and it is essentially justified all the way to the right, taken out of the normal context of the f content, and it's pushed as far to the right as possible. Now we're seeing here as well that where you've got uh, 10 pixels of padding, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, 10 pixels of padding to the right. Uh, so that's why we're seeing a little bit more yellow uh, on the other side. But what we can do is we can actually, just to drive that point home, we can set the background color to white and I'm gonna actually get rid of the ugly border for right now. So see here, uh, we've got the floated element and then we've got a, a margin of 10 pixels. So we've essentially pushed this element all the way to the right. And we can do the same uh, by setting float to the left. And interestingly enough, if I put this aside underneath the image, one may expect for the aside element to actually show up to the right of the image. Well, because we're using the float element, it's actually gonna take it out of the context of the normal flow of our HTML document, and it's going to place it to the left. So see, we've got the 75% width of our yellow container element, and we've floated the element to the left, so it defies sort of the intuitive sequential and chronological nature of the HTML markup that we're used to seeing. So we can use float to kind of highlight or take elements out of the context of uh, their particular chronology in HTML elements. And it's really important to note that floats are often abused for this purpose. And floats can really cause a lot of headache for you, particularly when you're managing and optimizing for different screen resolutions. So you want to make sure that you use the float uh, attribute very, very sparingly. It's one of the trickiest aspects of being a front-end engineer in working with CSS. So uh, use float as sparingly as possible. And thankfully, with uh, the latest version of CSS, CSS3, we get lots of different options in different ways for which we can accomplish the same result. And for this particular pattern, I think we want to actually use absolute positioning to highlight our particular call to action. So I'm gonna back out some of these changes and I'm gonna use absolute positioning 
to move this call to action to a more clear spot. And I'm gonna use coloring to kind of highlight this element to make it stand out in context with the rest of my web page. So I'm gonna back out some of our stylistic changes here. I'm gonna remove that float. I'm gonna get rid of our ugly background color. And I don't really need to set a width for my float container anymore. So we see how our uh, call to action now has kind of returned to that uh, non-floated state. It's taking up the entire width of our HTML web page because it's no longer floated. So we're getting the normal uh, expected behavior of a div block level element here or an aside block level element here. So it's spanning the entire width of the page. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna basically take this block and I wanna just position it here on the bottom right hand corner of my page. And in order to do that, we could use what's called absolute positioning in the context of our CSS. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually set a width and I'm actually going to as well uh, set my background color to make this stand out a little bit more. And I'm gonna make the text color white and I'm gonna make the font weight bold. What happened there? We got the font weight bold, background color, colors white, padding, we've set the width. So we lost, oh, there we go. Oh. All right, there we go, okay. And we may wanna set the, uh, the anchor tag here to reflect that uh, white color as well. So we're going to set the color of the anchor tag inside the aside element to a color white. And what I'd also like to do is specify a pseudo selector and essentially remove the, uh, the underline when the anchor tag is just rendered, but when I mouse over it, it's going to actually change so that it has an underline. So let's see how that works. So now when I mouse over that particular anchor, I get the underline effect, but it doesn't really affect the aesthetic of the call to action, right? I'm gonna actually make this um, width a little smaller. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to actually use absolute positioning to put this element, remove it from the normal flow of the content, and I'm gonna position it here in the bottom right-hand corner of my web page. So I'm gonna use absolute positioning, and I'm gonna set my bottom to zero and my right to zero. So if we kind of thought of our HTML web page like a big grid, an XY Cartesian coordinate system, and we looked at the bottom and the right of our web page, well, we're going to position our element so that it shows up right at the origin, which is at point zero zero. So watch what happens. So I've used absolute positioning to essentially remove this element from the normal flow of our HTML document and basically stick it uh, in the bottom right hand corner of my screen. Now notice here if I scroll that that is no longer maintained. I've absolutely positioned it in the context of my current view and when I refresh the page it's going to show up uh, according to where it is uh, when we render the page. And see how it moves as I change the resolution of my browser. And this is what absolute positioning does. It's going to always kind of make that element stand out at the bottom right hand corner of my screen, no matter where uh, from a markup and flow standpoint that actually occurs. Now, this is great. But watch what happens when I scroll. It doesn't stick. I want it to actually be uh, permanently sort of uh, positioned in that right-hand corner. 
So how do I accomplish that? Well, I can use a position fixed to basically make that call to action permanently in kind of stuck and attached to the bottom right hand corner of my browser window. And similarly, I can define uh, a position that positions it in the top left. So you can play around with the absolute and fixed positioning to get this uh, sort of uh, sticky, if you will, uh, element that sort of persists as I scroll through my HTML document. Now, notice that um, because I've positioned it here in the top left, this isn't really desirable, right? I really want to stick it in the uh, bottom right. But let's use the Chrome Inspector here just to play with some of these attributes. So notice that if I increase my top attribute, I'm just going to embiggen this for everyone's benefit here. Notice how it is moving further down the page. So we use the top and left and right and bottom attributes to basically set where we would like to position that element on the page. And absolute positioning is going to take it out of the normal flow context and place it basically relative to the body by default. And we're going to show another circumstance where we can actually anchor this in a different direction. And oh, do we have a question? Is it in Slack? That's weird. I'm not seeing it. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not seeing it. Oh, you know what? I might be in the uh, the older Slack channel. That's what it is. Um, launch HTML course. So I just got to rejoin the right Slack channel here. I was in the wrong channel. Here we go. And yeah, we can totally uh, use absolute positioning for our nav bar, for calls to action, and later we're going to use relative positioning for the captioning of our uh, image here. Uh, but let's continue to play around with these top and uh, left attributes. Notice how this is pushing the element further down the page. And if I manipulate the left attribute, I push it f deeper into the page. So this is essentially giving us the coordinates at which we want to position the top left-hand corner of our box, right? Remember from the box model episode that all of our HTML elements basically comprise of a, of a box. There's width, height, uh, padding, border, and then margin. So all of those essentially create a big rectangle around these elements. So now not only can we specify margin, padding, and border in width and height, but we can actually manipulate the default location by which where that element occurs. So absolute positioning is kind of a very opinionated placement of where that HTML element is going to reside. So you can see how the position fixed here is keeping that element always in the same spot in the context of our HTML web page. Cool. All right. So let's actually change this back to uh, showing up in the bottom right hand corner. And you can see how actually pretty that is with our current layout because it's totally not overflowing or overlapping any existing content. Now on a smaller resolution screen, that could actually get a little pesky. And uh, later we'll show how we can deal with that circumstance and deal with that sort of overflow of content as well. So, but let's move on and talk a little bit about uh, relative positioning. So let's say, for example, I wanted to provide some text to basically uh, describe the image here that uh, depicts my two dogs, uh, Linux and Apple. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to actually create a new, cl uh, new element here directly under my image. And I'm going to call it an image caption. And I'm going to say my two dogs, Linux and Apple. Now, notice without any styling, the HTML is going to do as you would expect. The content is going to show up directly underneath the image. And let's make this a little prettier, work on some of the aesthetics here. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to create a new class called an image container. And we're going to have both of these elements contained by it. And again, that's not going to change anything for us stylistically, but we're going to use this to our advantage in just a minute. And let's actually create this image caption style so that it's just a little nicer. So I'm going to set the background color to that pink color that we use for the aside. And I'm going to set the color to white. And I'll set the font mm, to italic. So let's see what that looks like. So it being a div element, it's going to try to uh, extend the width to the full available width of my uh, container. So if I want to constrain this div element to match the width of my image, well then what I need to do is I need to manipulate some of the CSS rules. And that's why I created this image container. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to my image declaration here. And I'm going to actually make the image container 400 pixels wide. And then I'm going to set the image itself to take up 100% of the width of that container. Now watch how this affects the layout. Now my background only extends and is flush with the width of the image. So this is great and this is cool, but wouldn't it be neat if I could actually have this caption kind of overlay the image itself? Well, to do that, I'm going to use what's known as relative positioning. So I'm going to set the container to have relative positioning so that anything that I absolutely position inside of it is going to actually be boxed in by the relative parent. And this is super, super confusing, so we're gonna talk through this as I do it. So I'm setting the image container to relative positioning, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move down my image caption rule so that everyone can have clarity of all the involved elements. And I'm gonna actually set the position to absolute here. Watch what happens in the context of this caption. Now it has positioned itself and has anchored itself inside the container to the uh, origin of the container itself. Notice it didn't break it out and put it at the top of the page, and that's because I defined the position relative in the image container parent. So this image caption is now anchored to that container. So we can absolutely position our elements inside a relatively positioned image. Super, super confusing, but essentially what we've done by setting our container uh, to position relative is we've basically allowed everything inside it to be absolutely anchored and positioned to where that container itself starts. So you see that behavior here. Now watch what happens if I remove the positioning inside the container. Now that caption has completely lost the context 
in the nesting context of my image container and it's gone all the way up to the body tag and absolutely positioned itself according to where that begins. So we need the absolute positioning uh, uh, to be kind of anchored by a relatively positioned parent and that's what we do here. Now notice also that the width of my element has changed. So we want to actually set the width to 100% here. So now my uh, element is overlaying the image itself and it spans and is flush with the overall dimension of the image. I actually would like for my caption to show up at the bottom of my screen. Oops. Uh, so I need to set my left in bottom. Uh, where'd it go? We've got our relative positioning. We've positioned it absolutely. So interestingly, let's take a look at what may have happened here. Position relative, position absolute. We've got our image container in the image caption. We've positioned it absolutely. It's interesting that that is occurring. I would have expected it to be bound within the image. So I may have some uh, non-compliant source code or something uh, along the, yeah, looks that way. So you can see here, here's a wonderful first case example of having non-compliant code. So let's see what's going on here. We've got the div, we've got the div. Let's actually take it outside of this uh, float container and see if we get the intended result. We do not. It's interesting. Let's inspect the element, do some real-time debugging here. Interesting. See, this image container should not be spanning the entire document. It should be spanning uh, just the available width. So that's why this is particularly interesting to me. Huh. So the height of this image container should actually not uh, be set so high uh, and that's why we're having some display issues here. So rather than positioning it, no we want to position it relative. Position this absolutely and we've got our left and bottom and our width percentage set here. So, uh, for our benefit, why don't we just stick with the top positioning here for now. And I'm going to debug and understand why that, uh, that height is spanning so large. It really shouldn't be. So I probably have a validation issue or some kind of other issue happening in this HTML document. But anyway, moving on, uh, we've basically said we're going to put the caption on the top of the image. And I'm going to actually modify this to have a little bit more padding so it looks a little nicer. And when I set my padding uh, like this, I also need to be mindful that it's going to add actually 20 pixels of uh, real estate in the context of my document here. So what I may want to do is I may actually want to set a static width here. I could do that, or I could specify um, a containing, uh, a 
a child element and set the margin there. Um, so we could do that. So. and set 10 pixels there. So we're gonna create a little bit of complicated markup here. To get the effect that we're looking for. And this is the wonderful world of CSS at play here. So you can see the margin has been set on the span. And if I wanted to, I could actually set the display to our span to not be in line, but I'm actually overriding the default display of the span element. And now I should get the intended sort of nice white space around my caption. Awesome. OK, so we've used a, rel a combination of relative and absolute positioning to essentially have this caption kind of overlay the image itself. And what's really neat uh, with modern browsers is we can actually set opacity. Let's see what this does. I think it's actually a decimal. So see here, my caption now has a little bit of a transparent effect. Uh, on the caption, so you can see what the pink uh, sort of overlay and caption is overriding or overlaying here. Now, this is really great, um, but I may, if I'm, for example, interested in seeing the top 100 pixels of this image, I may want this caption to go away. So in order to do that, I'm going to use CSS layering and pseudo selectors as a way to essentially hide this element. And in order to do that, we first need to talk a little bit about the Z index. Uh, so what we can do with CSS3 is we can actually layer our HTML elements on top of one another. So if you think of the elements that we have positioned here, where we have the image tag itself, and then we've got the image caption uh, overlaid above it, we've essentially got a stack of HTML elements the image tag being at the bottom of the stack, and the pink caption being at the top of the stack. Well, if I want to shuffle those around, I can actually specify the layer using a Z index attribute. So if I set my image itself to a Z index of two, and I set the image caption to a Z index of three, watch what happens. There should be no effect, and there isn't. But I set it this way so that when I specify I'm most over the caption, I'm gonna actually set the Z index to one and essentially shuffle the stack so that the caption is layered behind the image. <laughs> that did not work. What I want to actually do is uh, actually have it, when I hover over the image itself, I want that uh, the image caption to disappear. So we're going to set the image caption uh, Z index to 1. And then I'm going to specify a pseudo selector. And set the Z index to 1,000 when I hover over the image. Watch what happens. <laughs> that should have actually put the caption underneath the image but I think it has something to do with the way I've positioned these elements that we're not getting the intended effect. But essentially, you can use the index as a means to layer your elements on top of one another. Let's use a different and contrived example to drive this point home because I, 
uh, thought that my image would function uh, that way, but it's not. So let's just use some arbitrary boxes to basically drive this home. So we're just gonna set some HTML elements. And what we're going to do is we're going to absolutely position them and specify different widths. So actually we can just set IDs because these are the, going to be the only elements that will have these selectors. So we're going to go into our CSS. And we'll just set some arbitrary widths and some arbitrary uh, heights to drive this idea of z-index home. Okay, so we see the yellow in the green box here. And uh, because we haven't set any type of positioning, they're showing up in the normal flow of the HTML document. But notice what happens when I set position absolute, and we'll set top to zero and left to zero. And similarly for green, top to zero and left to zero. Because I've set the Z index of my caption so high, it's actually showing up on top of the yellow box. So I'm actually gonna take these out of the context of the container here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and throw them so that they show up on top here. Now notice, I don't see the green box. And that's because the yellow box takes precedence because it shows up first on the page. If I want the green to show up, I must specify a Z index that is greater than the yellow. So I need to put the green box and stack it above the yellow box. So in order to do that, I'm gonna set the Z index to 1000. And these numbers are arbitrary. It's up to you to define how you want the layering to occur and watch what happens now. <laughs> Today is not my day. Where'd my green box go? So the green box is there. Oh, we didn't set the position to absolute here. We need to do that. <laughs> okay, now the Z index demonstration should work. Yes, there we go. Sorry for that. So essentially what we have is we've got two absolutely positioned boxes. And if I go ahead and I go back to our original state here, and I reset our Z indexes, or comment these out, because of the flow of the content, my yellow box is showing up underneath the green box. If I put the green box in front of the yellow box, the yellow box overlays it. So in order to get the behavior of having the green box show up above the yellow box, we actually have to set those Z index properties. So I'm gonna set the Z index of our green box to be higher than that of the yellow box. <laughs> 
And that's how we get this idea of relative and absolute positioning, as well as our layering here. So, as I said, CSS positioning, as I showed uh, with some of my uh, demonstration here, it can often behave and uh, work in a way that you do not expect. But the important things to glean from this exercise is that you can use CSS to modify the positioning of your HTML elements. And using a combination of floats, clears, absolute relative positioning, and z-index layering, you can actually start to do some really nifty things with your HTML and CSS. We use z-indexes very often to mimic the idea of pull-down menus and other ways of sort of layering graphics on top of other graphics. So z-index kind of adds some dimension to the overall layout of our page. So now we can move things around using absolute and relative positioning. We can layer uh, those elements on top of one another. And we can create wonderful call to actions and overlays using the techniques that we've uh, determined here uh, in today's episode. What I'd like for you to do is to create a call to action on your web page. Maybe it's to follow you on Twitter or to connect with you on LinkedIn, whatever it might be. But use absolute positioning uh, or fixed positioning to actually create a similar call to action box on your web page. And similarly, use the, what we learned with relative positioning to create a caption for the image that you've already included and incorporated on your page. Thanks for bearing with me, and thanks for continuing to kind of brute force through this uh, CSS work that we're all doing together. I promise you, as you practice more, as you work more with HTML and CSS, you'll get a sense for its nuances and weirdness. And you saw how I use Chrome Inspector uh, and my various tools here to kind of debug that in real time. And that's really the whole process of working with HTML and CSS, is kind of making small incremental changes and seeing how that affects the overall layout of your page. So I hope that was useful for you, and I hope to see you in a, a later episode. Don't forget to get your resume in order. Uh, have that ready, because that's what we'll be diving into next week. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.